brighten up those dark mornings. Wheeler, Ollie, and Lecter. Mornings at the Cabin. Mornings at the Cabin, indeed. Wheeler and Lecter with you on your Wednesday morning post-election. Oh, wait, no, it's not. It's not post-election. It's still going. Uh, we kind of had a feeling that it would go this way. Um, wow. Actually, the uh, the graphic I'm just looking at right now is something we don't want to talk about. <laughs> um, wow. Okay. Nothing to do with the election, I'm sure. Oh, no, this, uh, this switch from the, I woke up this morning at like 4, and I checked it, and it was still like, there was still like 238 to 219. The graphic I'm looking at right now says 283 Trump, 254 Biden. Uh, which would make this is presumptive, though. I think this is projections. I don't think this is official in any way. Uh, yikes. Too close to call, says the Globe and Mail three hours ago. Yikes. All right. Well, there we go. I mean, <laughs> over, overnight, after we all went to bed, Trump declared victory, even though he's behind in the popular vote and the Electoral College. Uh, which is, you know. That's the way things. That's how. That's how he do. And then immediately claimed he won't be leaving office. Oh, you can't up. make him. I can't make. Can't After make claiming me. victory. Yeah. What a I've won, and you can't remove me from office. Well, it's like if you won. Yeah. That's yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> um, Ollie's not here this morning, so like he's not here to kind of you make know make sense of all make this. sense of all this. Yeah. yeah. Where's Ja Rule? Someone grab a hold of Ja Rule and help me make sense of all this. Where is Ja? For the love of God. <laughs> Where is Ja? I don't want to dance right now. I'm scared to death. Mornings at the Cabin, the podcast. Wheeler and Lecture with you on your Wednesday morning. Nothing clear uh, at all, I should say. Uh, I mentioned uh, earlier that I saw a graphic on a CBC but, uh, article that said uh, Trump at 283 uh, electoral votes, which would give him the presidency. That was a projection. Although, go to f- three different websites <laughs> and you get three different things. I don't know what to do. Errors and omissions. Ten minutes into the show. That's right. Errors and omissions <laughs> all the time. Like right now, I'm looking at U.S. election results. Results will update in 15 seconds on a CBC News. CBC News. Should it says wait? Joe Biden 270, Donald Trump 267. What are we at? 12 seconds now? Something like that. Uh, five seconds. So, But on the previous page, two, 224 to 213. Oh, it's, it's updated. Huh? I mean, right now, news is it in, over? Newsinteractives.cbc.ca is showing Joe Biden at 270, but there's still votes to be counted. Oh, so this is all just it's never this is presumptive victories in Nevada, Arizona, uh, presumptive victories for uh, Trump in Georgia, Pennsylvania, New- North Carolina. I um, election coverage is garbage. This is gonna, <laughs> this is, this is gonna be like garbage. the ending of Lord of the Rings. I don't know what. The, yeah, exactly. It's just gonna drag 14 on. different endings. Oh, oh my God. God! You're gonna be like the story is done. Yeah. Just let's Just, wrap it up. That's right. Also, Jesse, I couldn't help but notice uh-huh. you're, you've got your your cabin radio mic sock. Yeah. Uh, upside down on your mic. Is this some kind of political statement? That's right. That's oh. right. The whole world's topsy turvy. Jeez. Okay. Now I'm on. <laughs> now I'm on the Associated Press. Joe Biden two thirty eight. Donald Trump two thirteen. So. Hmm. But who are they associated with? Everybody, the Associated Press. Mm, um, are they? I don't know what to make of all this. <laughs> Where's Ollie? If you need a distraction I from the U.S. election, and I think we all do, mm-hmm. today is, of course, November 4th. And uh, Remember, remember the 4th? No, wait, that's not. That's tomorrow. Not, not quite. quite. No. Penny for the guy? <laughs> and as you know, every day has a national day of some kind of celebration. This is how you're distracting me by it. doing That's real right. basic radio guys. Hey, stuff. Jesse. Hey, what day is it's it? It's National Candy Day. Oh, that little candy day. I don't have any candy. We don't have any candy here. Yeah, we ran out real quick real after quick. Halloween. Well, we didn't really, like, when we were out the other night, we didn't really do a lot of trick-or-treating. We just well, we tried. Of, tried to. Yeah, do it. No. So there you go. That was a camera. So no candy. Thanks. No candy on National Candy Day. Thank you. It's also National Chicken Lady Day. As in Mark McKinney's Chicken Lady? That's what I thought. Amazing. But no, oh. it's someone else. National Chicken Lady Day on November 4th annually honors Dr. Marthenia Tina Dupree. For uh-huh. 12 years, Dr. Dupree worked for the second largest chicken restaurant in the world okay. as the Director of Community Relations and Training. She was widely known due to her work in the community. 
during this time, and through her work with the community and the people she helped, Dr. Dupree became known as the Chicken Lady. <laughs> what a flattering name to be bestowed upon one who has done Absolutely. lots of important work. Yeah, that's the Chicken Lady. That's just that's the Chicken Lady. Uh, Maybe it's a term of endearment. <laughs> Please don't call me that. Um, uh, an actual tweet from uh, a North Carolina newly uh, elected representative, a Republican representative, uh, tweets uh, from last night. Cry more, Lib. So that's where we're at with the U.S. Can we call him the Chicken Man? Politics. Yeah. I know this isn't the uh, this isn't the analysis you may need or want in the morning because it's just two guys who are really tired and don't really know what's going on. <laughs> um, but again, but then every right site you. I go to has a different result. CBC News Interactive projected like projecting or not calling it, but just having. 270 for Biden, 267 for Trump, which would make it, I think, the closest in history. I think that would make it. Let's just, yeah, let's just call it. It's the closest in history. That must be, that's probably it. Except Except for uh, maybe Dewey and. Well, that was, yeah, I don't know how how the electoral votes went with that one, but that's pretty damn close and close enough for for someone like uh, Trump who who wants to be, uh, you know, a dictator to be like, well. That's uh, unofficial, and it's too close, and blah, blah, blah. I He's do, already declared victory, so. I do wonder what the operations were like in uh, newspaper <laughs> presses today, and slash overnight. Like, what do we do? This is not probably going to be called, but it might be called sometime overnight. Uh, do yeah, we I just mean, I was, do two issues? I was, and I was, I was hoping that it would be uh, called overnight. I woke up at like 2 and like 4 and checked my phone. And like, oh, no, you didn't nothing sleep. Yet. Nothing yet. I, well, I slept a bit, but I just woke up a couple of times. Okay, well, there's, I got the uh, the closest elections in history, and it's like going through all of them. Here's a close look at number 57 on our list of Number closest, 57? On our list of closest ones ever. That's this one? Yeah. No, no. Oh. This, uh, no, don't, no. Um, okay, the, number one, the first one was in 1824. John Quincy Adams versus Andrew Jackson. Uh, I remember it well. Yeah, that's right. JQ. JQA uh, receiving 84 of 261 electoral votes. Runner-up, Andrew Jackson, somehow receiving 99 of 261. What? Nobody slept that night. What? 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 That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Try doing a morning radio show on that one. Number three, though, is the 2000 elections, George w., uh, George W. Bush and Al Gore, which was highly contested with a lot of uh, uh, recounting in, uh, in oh, Florida, especially recount, yeah. with yeah. the hanging chads and whatnot. Mm-hmm. 271, George Bush. To 266, so uh, a difference of five electoral votes right, right there. Uh, there you go. Pretty close. And that gave us Man Bear Pig. That's, that's it. That it did. Mm. That it did, Lecter. That yeah. it did. Good uh, good callback. Thank you. Yeah, very good. Um, again, um, just two guys, very tired. Don't really know what's going on. Um, but, yeah, CBC an hour ago, 224 to 213. Um, CNN, 224 to 213. CBC News Interactive, 270 to 267. I uh, don't know what to make of any of this. I mean, it's two men, men in their mid-70s. We knew it would be a slow race. That's right. That's right. They have to have their nap. That's right. Get, get up, <laughs> give them a pediasure, and prepare them for this news. Oh, my goodness. I wonder how many times Donald Trump soiled himself over the night. The Mornings at the Cabin podcast. Hey, it was early. What do you want from us? Wednesday morning? Hmm. Is it hump day? It is. All right. Let's get over this. Hump. That's all I got. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. Uh, some sad news. Actually, yesterday uh, to report, uh, you can find the story at cabinradio.ca. Uh, Max Ward passed away this week, and uh, he's an absolute legend in the av- aviation industry uh, and up here in the north. Uh, if you were lucky enough to catch a glimpse of his, uh, his plane, well, I mean, you catch a glimpse of his plane every time you roll into the city. Uh, the Bristol Monument there, that's pa- painted in Max Ward colors. And if you were lucky enough to see his twin otter every once in a while here in Yellowknife, it was such a beautiful plane. Uh, the blue and the red and the white, very, very uh, uh, a lovely thing. I always ex- got very excited when I was a kid to see that. Met Max uh, a few times. Um, my dad's, uh, my dad was uh, not close with him, but buddies with him anyway, and uh, always stopped to have a chat with Max when he was in town. Uh, he died at the age of 98. So Max had a pretty good run. But uh, founded the airline Ward Air, which uh, uh, if you've, you've probably flown on, if you've been here for uh, a longer period of time, I remember taking a Ward Air flight over to Kauai when I was in 
kindergarten. Oh, or wow. Grade one. Yeah, you could, you could, uh, you could uh, charter those flights. So to out Hawaii? Of, out of Edmonton. Wow. Yeah, with a 747. It's the first and only time I've been on a 747 jumbo jet. You know the one with the hump? Mm, sure. You know the big plane. I'm like, not a plane guy. Oh, for God's sake. I don't know the big plane. You know plane. the plane with the, the hump on the front. I don't know the plane with the yes, hump on the front. Yes, you do. You do. It's, well, I mean, originally that was the original jumbo jet, and now everything with more than like 400 seats is a jumbo jet. Oh. Huh. See, I didn't know that either. Oh, my God. All this right. is all news to me, Jesse. Anyway, a long, uh, a long and uh, storied history here in the North with aviation and just here in the North in general. Um, uh, 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 yeah, uh, by, and by all accounts, uh, uh, a gentleman and um, a man with strict standards. Oh, really? To, according to Ray Weber. In the story, Emily Blake has that for you. Um, yeah. I mean, that's a, that's, a, that's a big piece of Northern history right there. And uh, we uh, send our condolences to, uh, to Max's family and all his friends. And, um, yeah, I mean, 98, it's a pretty good run. That is a pretty good run. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what, what kind of strict standards? I'm interested Well, according to, to Ray Weber, uh, who flew with Ward Air during his career, said he would often catch up with Ward and his son when they returned to Yellowknife on their way back to camp. Weber said watching Ward's airplanes land to take off in the Illinois back bay made him want to be a bush pilot. Oh. Right? And, uh, but he said he, was, uh, he always enjoyed working for Max. He was not a hard man to get along with. Uh, but uh, just kind of reading down here, I uh, he said something about strict standards. There it is. <laughs> button up shirt. Button up, button up that shirt. <laughs> Close those doors on the airplane. Straighten oh. that cap. Straighten that cap. Shave those sideburns. I can get behind that. That's right. Um, yeah. Very cool. Um, he said he was a good company primarily because of Max. He had some pretty strict standards, which I think most of us understood. Now, it doesn't go into what these standards are, but just said he was strict standards. But that's what made his uh, company run so well. I mean, I think in general, as a, as a pilot, you probably should have some, yeah, you should probably have some strict standards. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not a bad thing. That's fair enough. Yeah. I hadn't seen Max in a lot of years. So, uh, yeah, that's a, it is some sad news, but uh, uh, we, we celebrate his legacy and, uh, and again, provided so much... Uh, so much to the story uh, of Yellowknife and the North. Uh, like I said, Emily Blake has that story for you at cabinradio.ca. The Mornings at the Cabin podcast was recorded before a sort of live, thankfully not in the studio, audience. If you've been listening, and I hope you have, for the last few months, Dragon Toner, the law firm celebrating its 10-year uh, 10, uh, its ten year anniversary, has been donating $1,000 to a local good cause every month from March until December. Now, we figured that that must mean this is the ninth, but because of that pesky pandemic, they did skip a month. So this is number eight, and uh, this month's recipient is the NWT Literacy Council. So congratulations to them. I have Katie Johnson on the line. She's the Family and Community Literacy Coordinator for the NWT Literacy Council. Let's say hi to her. Katie, welcome. Thank you. Good morning. Hey, good morning to you. Uh, congratulations, first of all, for the, being the recipient of Dragon Toner's uh, wonderful donation uh, this month. Um, how does it feel to be selected by by them for this uh, this nice little donation? Um, it feels great. We were very appreciative of um, when we found out that we were getting the money. Absolutely. So, I mean, uh, what uh, the, the first question we've been asking is, how are you going to spend all that dough? So this year, um, obviously with the pandemic, we've had to change the way we do a lot of our activities. Mm -hmm. Normally we would travel to communities and do activities within the community, and um, that's, we're not doing this. We're doing all virtual events. Yep. And so we're going to use this money to purchase books and mail them to everyone who participates in the event. Ah. So last week we had our annual trick-or-treating, and we did a virtual trick-or-treating. People could send in photos of their trick-or-treaters from any community, and we have way more participants um, than we've ever had. So oh, that's, that's amazing. the first thing that some of the money's going to. Very nice, very nice. And uh, as uh, the family, uh, family and Community Literacy Coordinator, what's it? What's your day-to-day -day like? Usually we're planning um, our big annual training that's four days here in Yellowknife, and then also traveling out to communities and uh, supporting facilitators as they're running their program. So, again, that's a little different this year, and we're actually launching our virtual family literacy training today. Um, so we're going to be able to connect with people in a whole new way. Very cool. Very cool. 
You just uh, posted that about, actually on your website the other day, Katie, nwcliteracy.ca. I'm just looking at it now. Uh, the Skill Builders for mm-hmm. Youth Annual Training Online Zoom Sessions. Obviously, that is a, a, a byproduct of, uh, of the pandemic and, and traveling to different communities being more difficult than it was this time last year. Um, tell us mm-hmm. a bit about what that program is going to look like this year. So for our family literacy training, we're doing multiple live interactive video sessions where we're actually mailing everyone all the supplies they would need to be as hands-on as our normal in-person training. And then also some pre-recorded sessions. And then you're right, Colleen, our youth and literacy coordinator, is also taking skill builders for youth online this year. So um, people can apply for that training, which, again, will be um, virtual sessions where they're sent all the supplies, as well as our oral health literacy program. The training for that is also going virtual. So we're... We're taking lots of things that are normally in person uh, online this year. Yeah, that's been the uh, pretty much the major shift for for everybody. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's, yeah. it's presented some unique challenges for uh, all different types of businesses and and, and organizations. Mm-hmm. So it's very cool to see you guys just uh, kind of jump right into it and uh, kind of get, getting everything online and making those uh, the uh, adapting uh, as it were, like uh, yeah, exactly, like you have to. Um, I uh, wanted to uh, ask uh, f- for anybody else. Uh, you guys, you are you are a registered uh, charity or not for profit? How can uh, people donate if they uh, if they want to follow uh, Dragon Toner's example? Right. So if you want to donate, you can go onto our website. Um, it's Scott Minton. It's nwtliteracy.ca. Yes. And right on our homepage, there is a, a donate now, and it takes you right to Canada Helps, which you can donate right online. And we're also launching a very exciting fundraising campaign today. All right. Uh, so people can watch our social media to see how they can donate that way. All right. Do you want to you give us a hint or do we have to wait? Oh. <laughs> um, it supports both the NWT Literacy Council and five local businesses. Oh, very cool. Nice. Right on. Right yeah. on. And when is that going to launch? So it's it's launching launch- at some point today. Yeah, uh, it'll be on our Facebook today. Awesome. That's wonderful. Well, hopefully you'll get uh, a few more donations today, and you can become a member uh, of the Literacy Council as well there. I see that button. There's the donate button. Become a member. Sign up for Literacy this week by sending your email address. All this at nwtliteracy.ca. Uh, I mean, congratulations on getting the uh, getting the uh, donation from Dragon Toner. They've been doing such great work, giving yeah. out donations to uh, worthwhile organizations throughout the year. Uh, so uh, congratulations on being picked. That's amazing. All right. Thank you. And huge thank you to Dragon Toner. Absolutely. Awesome. All right. Well, Katie, thanks so much for joining right. us this morning and talking about the NWC, uh, NWT Literacy Council. Uh, you guys have yourselves a great day and best of luck with the uh, new fundraising. Thank you very much. You have a great day, too. All right. Thanks so much. Katie Johnson, Family and uh, Community uh, Literacy Coordinator for the NWC Literacy Council on the line there. Uh, Dragon Toner giving them a 1000 bucks this month. Dragon Toner has a couple no- more donations to do to celebrate that 10th anniversary. This was their 8th, so they got uh, 9 and 10. We wait with bated breath to see who they give that money to. Big ups to uh, the uh, NWT Literacy Council for all their hard work and, of course, to Dragon Toner. The Mornings at the Cabin podcast. Uh, a few highlights to end off the show, but I wanted to start with this one main thing. Uh, it's a CBC story that dropped this morning. Um, self-isolation hotel is a free-for-all, says Yellowknife truck driver. Now, this is something that we've been hearing about, kind of whispers about for uh, quite some time. As you know, uh, working at uh, uh, working at a certain place, sometimes people tell you some things, and we, we get a lot of people that are just coming out of isolation, going back to their community or whatever, mm-hmm. and um, we get uh, a lot of stories. We do. And... Um, and uh, one of the stories was that that like a certain hotel, I won't say which, was just a party town. Yeah, like they were in there for isolation. They spent two weeks there, people going in and out of people's rooms and and not isolating. And 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 some I've I've we've heard stories of people going downtown and, and getting some groceries and things like that, which mm-hmm. is all like understandable behavior. You're a block away from the uh, uh, from the grocery store. Unfortunately, that's illegal. Yeah, and not supposed to be being done. So uh, Kevin Benson. A truck driver who went to uh, had to go for a medical appointment in BC and couldn't isolate upon returning home because he has a roommate. 
And right, I mean, we we discussed this last month where yep. Phoenix and I were going to try to uh, isolate separately, but it's just... We all had a good laugh. An immense pain in the ass. Yep. Yeah. We all had a good laugh, even though we didn't completely understand it. Um, <laughs> so his, he says his uneasiness began, uh, as uneasiness at the hotel began, the moment he left the airport, he said, we all piled into cabs with fellow self-isolators, no real regulation of where we went once we left the airport. Mm-hmm. And he said people were going in and out of people's rooms. Um, you kind of get to know people, he said. Benson said people generally wore masks, but little else to do uh, to follow distancing protocols. Uh, obviously, the security guards are there at the hallway to make, but I mean, what are they supposed to do? Yeah. Um, all they do is write down the time you leave your room, and when you come back, they're not really there. I mean, they can't run it like a prison, yeah. which is one of his complaints, but not really a complaint. It's just like you can't really do that. Yeah, it's definitely it's definitely a gray area type yeah. of situation where like yeah, you you know, everyone knows what the restrictions are. Yes. They are doing what they've been instructed to do, which is yeah. self isolate in a in a different location at a hotel. Mm-hmm. But beyond that, yeah, I don't it's it's kind of tough. I don't know how you you know, beyond just like expecting people to yeah. adhere to the uh, to the restrictions, I don't know really what you can do. I guess like Protect NWT is here for that sort of thing. That's right. But... He sent complaints to Protect NWT, yeah. of course, uh, saying that like the security guards are uh, not directed to closely monitor every person as though it were a prison. Fair enough. You yeah. can't run it like a prison. You can't, no. you can't do that. People still have rights. Yeah. Uh, he instead encouraged uh, the security guard, encouraged him to, uh, if you saw people breaking the rules, report that behavior. Um, uh, to the staff at the self-isolation center, whatever mm-hmm. hotel that happens to be, yeah. or to protect NWT, uh, did not address, um, yeah, Mike Westwick uh, did not, who's the spokesperson for the JWT yeah. in this in this case, did not uh, address the use of cabs as transport to these self-isolating hotels, which absolutely probably shouldn't be happening. Mm-hmm. They should be on a shuttle that's, that's wiped down and cleaned every time they bring somebody in it. Uh, but Benson said it made him furious. Uh, that he have to come back and like, he's forced to do this, and we've also heard that other people are not being—they're not forced to go into self-isolation. They are literally going into Alberta or BC or wherever on purpose yeah. to come back in order to stay in a hotel for two weeks. Right. So there's a lot of thing, a lot of people seemingly taking advantage of yeah. this, and while they're there, not following protocols. And since we've doubled our cases, yes, it only went from five to ten, but we doubled our cases in the last two weeks. Um, we know that it's there. We know that there's a risk. So I don't know what you do from there because you're right. You can't run it like a prison. No. Um, so what do you do? It's kind of one of those situations too, where for all we know, you yeah. know, um, uh, Benson's, uh, you know, he said he made he made a complaint to protect NWT. Yeah. For, you know, we've heard stories from, from other people about, uh, yeah, like what's going on in the hotels and that how, yeah, people are just like going from room to room and, and having a party while they're self-isolating. Um, but for all we know that that might be the first complaint yeah. that has actually like officially yeah, been filed to protect NWT about it. Uh, maybe not. Maybe other people have, uh, have filed complaints as well, mm-hmm. but you know, if it's kind of an insular thing and there's just kind of like rumors going around, unfortunately there's not a lot of concrete action before now that that could have been taken. That's right. And I don't know that there's much they could do. There is even beyond. You, you can know? try to force people to stay in their rooms, but you can't really do that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's. I mean, I, I don't. I don't see how you make it more strict. The what? The part that I mean, the part that really bothers me. Other than that, like other than uh, mingling around and stuff like that. But it's. I mean, it's two weeks in a hotel. It's not two weeks in your home. No. Two weeks in your home is is some somewhat tough enough, mm-hmm. right? Not being able to go out. Like you can go out and walk your dog. Yeah. And go for a drive. Yeah. Or whatever. But like. Staying in your home for two weeks is is tough to do. Yeah. Uh, so staying in a hotel room for two weeks even tougher because mm-hmm. it's just the one room. What do you, you just watch TV, eat, and like there's staff on hand to do your like little errands and things like that, but not much else. Right. Uh, you go for a walk. That's all. That's all you can do. So yeah. it's it, it's incredibly tough for some people. It's a bit of a vacation. That's the part that bothers me. Not the it. I mean the the intermingling around among rooms bothers me as well. But people who are using it as a vacation. That bothers me. Yeah. That I bothers mean, me. I, I mean, I, I guess in theory, if people are all uh, arriving at the hotel, like, the, you know, chances are they're not coming from the same place. I, I'm sure some are, but, uh, you know, people are coming from all different places, wherever they happen to be, you know, for yep. whatever reason. They're coming back into the territory. They are self-isolating on the same schedule. I guess in theory, there's 
no, there's no reason why they shouldn't be able to visit each other. Like it still kind of defeats the purpose yeah. because if one of those those people has COVID nineteen and the other, you know, four, five, six, seven don't, yeah, then they've then all then they've all got it. Yeah. But at least they still have to, you know, serve out their self isolation. I suppose, <laughs> in yeah. General. Um, uh, but yeah. it is kind of like a situation where, um, you know, it's almost like, well, if people are just going to be mingling anyway, then maybe we just. You know, do the old uh, do the old Edinburgh uh, Scotland way, yeah. and just uh, just wall them off. Wall just them quarantine. off. Quarantine. Go ahead, have a party. Wall them off in the old Coke <laughs> oven. We'll make it three weeks because you're Actually, clearly having a great time. Ram all down with lie. <laughs> um, uh, and I, I mean, it's this is this is a completely understandable human behavior. You're locked into a, a hotel for two weeks. You're sharing. You're sharing it with these people. They're all kind of sharing the same experience. Yeah. Let's all have a drink together or whatever, right? Because for I mean, sure. they're probably yeah. getting cabin fever and things like that. And yeah. interesting enough. Uh, Benson, the truck driver, said he's got another appointment uh, this month, but this time he plans to use a friend's cabin to self-isolate. So, yeah. I mean, he's got an opportunity there that a lot of other people don't have. Mm-hmm. It's good for him. And he said because he doesn't feel safe, he feels like he has more of a chance of getting uh, COVID at the isolation center yeah. than he did in Vancouver. That's so that's fair enough. not a great that's not great. Well, I'm glad he's got a cabin because I can tell you one thing: Kevin surely has got uh, himself uninvited from any of those hotel parties. That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What a narc, man! You're not a li- you're not invited to our party. And he's like, that's that's fine. That's, I'm, a, that's I'm okay. perfectly all right. Yeah. With that. And it's just like, yeah. What is the security guard supposed to do? You can't stop people from mingling. Like, what do you? Yeah. You know, get get in their face and get like you have no authority to do that. Yeah. So. That's tough. That's real tough. So, I mean, it's, I'm glad someone kind of came forward and told that story because, I mean, it's kind of flying in the face of everything that we've kind of kind of bought into. Mm-hmm. But there it is. Um, just to uh, finish up the show here, uh, a couple of highlights from the election. We still don't have a winner, of course, but we'll uh, obviously update that uh, for you throughout the day. Um, still, some, uh, still a matter of some conjecture, uh, even though Trump has declared that he was a winner and also uh, tweeted that it's very strange that votes seem to be changing the outcome. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, like, I mean, whatever. It's strange times. Yeah, strange times. Well, it's just an authoritarian government. That's all. Well, we haven't taken anything you said seriously for the last four years anyway. Why That's start right. now? That's right. So a couple of highlights, though. Uh, some uh, some good uh, some good, and some bad. Sarah McBride elected as uh, uh, the U.S.'s first transgender state senator. And that is, uh, pardon me, that is in Delaware. So that's a very, very cool, a progressive step there in the U.S. And a couple of not-so-progressive steps, of course. Uh, looks like a man... Uh, in North Dakota, uh, state legislator state legislature David Andel, fifty five, died from coronavirus last month. Still elected to his seat. Well done, Republicans. Always voting for the dead. That's an American um, hero, right? And there. also Madison Cawthorn, who is now the youngest member of the uh, U.S. House of Repre- Representatives in history. So uh, when you hear that, you're like, "Oh, that's cool, a youngin." And then you're like, oh, "Okay, he's a Republican. Okay, uh, it is what it is." Um, but also. Uh, he tweeted out after his uh, after his uh, victory. We mentioned this earlier. Uh, Cry more, lib. Oh. So this is a very reasonable twenty five year old Republican. Also uh, has been accused by several women of sexually aggressive behavior and sexual assault. Also uh, went to uh, <laughs> went to uh, Hitler's residence in Germany on a vacation and uh, used in the, his Instagram post Führer, and also said that visiting the house had been on his bucket list for quite some time. So, there it is, a couple of highlights. But we'll stay with Sarah McBride on the positive highlight, elected as the country's first transgender state senator. Uh, congratulations there. Not so much to Madison or to David Andal, who can't hear your congratulations anyway, because he did. Um, there it is. We had a great time watching uh, some of the election last night. Had a great time explaining to uh, Megan Brackenberry what a talk show is and whether or not comedians should appear on them. They do, <laughs> and they exist. It's a very generational thing. Wrapping it all up. That's going to do it for Mornings at the Cabin. Stay tuned to the news uh, throughout the morning with Sarah Sibley, but also lunchtime news with uh, Ollie Williams. Uh, hopefully we'll have some sort of clearer picture by then, but it's sounding like this is going to last into the day and into the rest of the week. So uh, stay tuned to cabinradio.ca for more news on that. And, uh, you know, put your heads down between your legs and kiss your butt goodbye. Talk to you guys tomorrow. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening. Check out more from the show at cabinradio.ca and by following the Mornings at the Cabin Facebook page.